The Rubik Cube, brainchild of Hungarian professor Erno Rubik, is rapidly assuming the status of a world cult. It's one of those fiendishly brilliant and disarmingly simple ideas that can revolutionize the game's market overnight. There's even the first World Rubik Cube Championship in the offing. The British heats were held yesterday, resulting in a new world record of 25.79 seconds. But with the great Christmas games rush now in full swing, Professor Rubik may have started more than he bargained for. John Watkinson now reports. It's been called the insomniac's dream, the destroyer of marriages, the fastest route to insanity. But for a chosen few, the problem's no longer how to solve the cube, but the speed with which the solution can be reached. What have you got against the same? Mr. Rubik? From 27,000 entries, 10 finalists have won their way through a series of regional heats to the British Rubik Cube final in the plush surroundings of London's Savoy Hotel. An occasion such as this would be incomplete without the high priest of this particular brand of cubism, Erno Rubik himself. He's not just a household name the world over, He's one of the very few communist millionaires. So how does he account for the cube's success? It's a very basic form and a very basic problem. And, and, <clears throat> and there are no any, any, any special national uh, uh, style or, or something like that. There, there are international things, I think so. It all started six years ago. Rubik invented the cube to help his students at Budapest University to think in three dimensions. In 1978, the American toy company Ideal bought the marketing rights to the puzzle. It really began to take off as the last children's craze, skateboarding, began to fade away. There are some who say that the cube will go the same way. But for the moment, it's a salesman's dream. It's easy to handle, pleasing to the eye, and a brain teaser of infinite variety. Worldwide, Ideal reckon they've sold more than 25 million cubes, worth about 100 million pounds. It's by far and away um, our best seller clearly this year, and I should think it's the best seller by a long chalk in the toy industry, not only in this country, but all over the world this year. Uh, these things don't come along very often, but when they do come along, uh, it's very pleasant, but the objective really is to sustain the, the market which we've discovered and uh, try and build on it in a worthwhile way in the future. We British don't exactly skimp our children when it comes to presents. We spend as much as £50 per child a year. In all, the market's worth £700 million, and now's the time when most of it's spent. For many toy firms, as much as three quarters of their year's takings will come in these last few weeks of December. Most of them could do with a Rubik-style success to get them through what's been, so far, a disappointing year for business. In Hamley's, a Regent Street, the toy market showcase, Puzzle Corner is buzzing with a whole new range of products, proof that companies have been trying to cash in on the market that Rubik created. The Circus 7, the Varicone Pyramid, the Missing Cube Puzzle, and the maddening liquid geometry. But in the last few months, it's the snake, yet another invention of Rubik that's moving up the toy top 10. Already, it's the number six bestseller, but it's one that slipped through the fingers of Ideal. Well, I think when the snake was first seen uh, by our company, it was decided that perhaps it wasn't quite in the direct stable that the, the Rubik's Cube has established. Uh, in retrospect, the snake's been a very successful product, and um, I think we've been a mistake. We would like to have had it. But the biggest spin-off is the rip-off. Cheap imitations are pouring in from such countries as Hong Kong and Taiwan. This is the Rubik Cube, made in Hungary and costing five pounds. This is a cheap imitation from Taiwan and costs only one pound, and it's hardly worth that, say ideal. All told, they reckon there are more than 60 varieties of cubes, with sales approaching their 25 million. Worldwide, they know they're fighting a losing battle, but in this country, they've taken action in the courts to protect their copyright and to stop the sale of these cheap copies. The Black Mountains Abergavenny, the unlikely setting for Mark Elliott's one-man assault on the puzzle market. He set up business five years ago. Then, as now, he's insisted on it remaining home-based. 
Entirely self-taught, he designs and makes his own prototypes. He broke into the market with two games, Junk and Skirid. But now he thinks he's got a puzzle that might even upstage the cube. It's called the Great Pyramid Puzzle. Well, you've got, you start off, you've got a pyramid structure. The blue part is a pyramid structure, which is on a chrome stand. You have 36 triangles with patterns on them. All the patterns are different. And if I play this piece, I'm looking for a piece which will match here and here. And that does. That's OK. And now I'm looking for a piece which will match both here and here. And if I, I think I'm right here, that one will go in there. Now you're, you're creating a matching pattern. You have to do that on all four sides of the pyramid, including down the spines, as I say, on all four sides, until you have one total matching pattern which covers the pyramid with the triangles. And there you've, you've begun to solve the problem. Elliot is manufacturing 5,000 pyramids a week through Waddington's, one of Britain's largest toy companies. And he's the first person to build a cash prize into a commercial puzzle. For each pyramid that's sold, one pound is set aside for prize money. So far, the figure's 25,000 pounds. To win it, all you've got to do is calculate, or is it guess, a 12-digit number connected with the 36 triangles. Elliot gives you a couple of clues, and then you're on your own. If it all sounds complicated, it is. But Elliot says it's nothing compared to the problem of getting the £100,000 needed to launch the Great Pyramid. I started from, from zero and I uh, did the rounds. I went to 42 different banks, institutions, finance houses, government agencies and so on. Um, when I was halfway through the negatives, about 25 had said no, I contacted Maggie Thatcher. I wrote it to Geoffrey Howe. I was put onto the Department of Industry. Um, and one by one they said no. Uh, and I then had a decision to make. One was that I'll go to America, where the streets are paved with gold and they're sure to back me there. Or I will go to a company in this country um, who uh, will be prepared to give me credit. And I went to Waddington's, um, and I think, very sensibly, they decided that they would. Elliot cuts out the shopkeeper by selling directly to the public through the pages of the Sunday colour supplements. That way, he keeps more of the profit and can run his business from his study with the secretary next door. For him, there's only one way to get business, through the hard sell. The cube, on the other hand, breaks all the rules. It sells itself. In this country, there's no advertising at all. It gets more than enough publicity from the millions of words written about it by others. The maths department of a bookshop is a strange place to find bestsellers, but in the last few months, at least 10 different titles have appeared telling you how to solve or just live with Rubik's Cube. And this book has been one of the publishing sensations of the year. You Can Do the Cube has been bought by more than a million people, making it the fastest seller since Lady Chatterley's Lover. Patrick Bossett is almost certainly the world's most successful 13-year-old author. This Richmond schoolboy, equally at home with computer circuits as with the Cube, has made close to £50,000 from his best seller. I was I thought it might just sell about 10,000 copies, but it's sold over a million, which came as a shock. One night I got a phone call and they said, congratulations, we've gone over the million mark. Well, what do you think of all these uh, follow-ups to, follow to the cube? I like them a lot. They all work on cube principles, except for the pyramid and the snake, which are slightly different. But my favourite of the lot is the barrel, because when you muddle it up, it loses its shape, it starts sticking out in all directions. And so you have to get its shape to solve it, as well as the colours. Rubik's Cube has spawned a mini industry in the puzzle market. But how long is it all going to last? For many in the toy business, Rubik's Cube is mentioned in the same breath as the all-time bestsellers, like Monopoly and Scrabble. Games like these stand alone, as big money spinners year in, year out. Rubik could now be in this class. Rubik is clearly the name that has authority in this puzzle market, if indeed there is going to be a puzzle market. It's most important that we use that name responsibly and develop products which are consistent with the reputation that we have now established with Rubik. And uh, I believe that Rubik will become synonymous with the uh, successful and interesting puzzles in the future. 
What do you think of Rubik's Cube? I think it's the best puzzle that's, <laughs> that's come onto the market uh, for the last, oh, goodness knows how long. I mean, it is a superb product. I think anybody who tries to follow it is a complete fool. <laughs>